So, okay, we are officially live. So yeah, Brian, just to give everyone some context for, for everyone who's listening, uh, just tell everyone like your name, what you do and what businesses you uh, currently run. Yeah, so my name is Brian Clayton. I am CEO of GreenPal. So GreenPal in one sentence is Uber for lawn mowing. So if you're a homeowner or you rent a house and you need this one simple chore done, you need to get your grass cut, you jump on GreenPal, you'll get five quotes back in less than a minute and you can hire the lawn mowing service you want to work with right through the app or website. Um, after that, if it goes well, you can book them for the rest of the season right through the app and pay them, and it just happens like magic in the background. Um, I, before GreenPal, I had a landscaping company, a traditional landscaping company that I started as a teenager in high school, just mowing yards as a way to make extra cash, and I uh, cut grass all through high school and college, and uh, after I graduated college, I had to figure out, okay, was I going to go into the job market or was I going to double down on this business? And I decided, okay, I'm going to double down on the landscaping based business and make it a real company. By the time I was 25, I had something like 50 employees. Um, and over a 15 year period of time, I, I built that first business into one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, uh, over 150 employees, $10 million a year in revenue. And in 2013, that company was acquired by one of the largest landscaping companies in the United States. Uh, so after that, I kind of retired, took some time off, and then I uh, recruited two co-founders and started GreenPal um, using the lessons I learned uh, building that first traditional uh, landscaping business and, and, and applying those into the digital space, uh, making hiring a lawn mowing service as easy as ordering an Uber. For sure. And were you always like a kid like in high school that was entrepreneurial or you had like multiple side hustles or what? Yeah, I'd like to tell you that I was born with the DNA of an entrepreneur, but the reality is I just, I, I wasn't. My dad forced me to mow my first yard. <laughs> I was uh, playing Nintendo on a hot summer day, and uh, he came into my yard and, and I, said, I mean, came into my house, and my, my, my room, and said, hey, uh, we have a job to do. Uh, we're going to mow the neighbor's yard. And so forced me to go cut the grass, and he and I mowed the yard, and we got paid $20 at the end of it, and we split 20 bucks. But I was hooked after that. I was hooked on uh, being able to chart my own course and set my own hours and, and not have a, having a boss. I just loved it. So I guess I figured out early on that I'm wired to love business. And I've actually, in my life, I've never had a boss. I've never had a traditional job. It's, it's, I've always owned and operated my own businesses. So I was forced into entrepreneurship by my father, but luckily it, it, it was a good fit for me. Yeah, for, I think a lot of people there's two types of entrepreneurs. One is you're born with it or the other, you kind of have an epiphany, a moment in life where you can't take it anymore and you want to do more with your life or you're not happy with your job and you just want to start a business. Um, and you don't have to be born an entrepreneur. You can learn it. Of course, it's going to be helpful if you have that natural DNA, but there's always yeah. an opportunity to be entrepreneurial. The information's out there and you have to learn. Yeah, I think, uh, to, I think anybody can be an entrepreneur, right? But I, I think there has to be almost an obsession with, with building a successful business because in the early days and years of starting any business from scratch, it's, it's very much a, a leap of faith. And it's very much going to be an exercise uh, for years that you're going to have to go backwards before you go forward, just in terms of like maybe what you're making running the business and uh, mm -hmm. the perceived progress that you're, that you're achieving running and starting your own business. So I think... Um, while anybody can be an entrepreneur, there's one like common uh, p piece of DNA is that like there's this obsession with with becoming successful and making something of yourself and your business is kind of the vehicle of that. Yeah. When you see entrepreneurs nowadays on, on social media, you know, everyone has the tag entrepreneur and yes, you can write entrepreneur, but there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a successful one. Now you having a lot more experience in the game of entrepreneurship, how do you kind of see appearing in the younger generation of them being entrepreneurs? Do you see them as, uh, you know, like they don't really know what they're doing or is it, does it look cool from the outside looking in? Um, what's kind of like your perspective on like the younger generation? of? Yeah, great question. I, I do some mentoring uh, for uh, new startups, new business owners, new entrepreneurs in Nashville where I live. Uh, I do that for free. This is for fun. And there is one common thing I see with a lot of uh, younger uh, entrepreneurs is that uh, the entrepreneurship has now become a little, it's become sexy. Um, mm -hmm. It's become something that 
is more accessible um, and the ideal of it is become a, uh, more accessible. And it is easier to like get started as an entrepreneur today than it certainly was 20 years ago when I was getting started. Um, however, the reality is, is there's a big gap between that perception and what is what's, what actually an entrepreneur is. And so for me, my opinion of an entrepreneur is somebody that takes an idea that's brand new and goes what, what Peter Thiel calls zero to one, uh, something that doesn't exist and, and somebody who's just insanely uh, focused on bringing that idea to life and over a, over a very hard journey uh, uh, is what an entrepreneur is. And so for me, a lot of, a lot of people that mm, might call themselves entrepreneurs uh, are really just more or less self-employed uh, or they have, a, they have a job that they own maybe essentially, uh, but they're not truly uh, engaged in entrepreneurship. And so that's just kind of one of the, the myths that I, that I run across a lot uh, when I'm mentoring younger entrepreneurs. Also, there's, there's kind of like, if you watch any movie about entrepreneurship, uh, whether it be like a movie like The Social Network or something like that, there's this, there's this period of entrepreneurship that's just not fun, not sexy, and it's not ever talked about. It's just like the slog. It's the years of toiling uh, over the idea, over like the hard work that it takes to bring it to life. It's the sleepless nights. It's the seven days a week. And like in any movie about entrepreneurship, that, that period of time is, is, is like set against like a, a, a music montage. Like it just skipped over and it's like, it, and, and it's not ever like talked about. So that's something that a lot of new entrepreneurs, uh, naive ones don't really understand is like, you're, you're going to have to work on this thing, maybe even for free for a very, very long time before you're able to breathe life into it, especially if you're going to be bootstrapped, if you're going to be self-funded. Uh, and so that's, that's something that that's a misconception that I, that I see quite a bit. Yeah. And I think nowadays, a lot of people who scroll on your social media, you know, they get very impatient or they look at other young entrepreneurs and they feel that they have to do it. Right. But, you know, you, I'm pretty sure like you didn't have the, the tools at that time, you know, social media, Instagram, Facebook, you were probably just working on with the website initially. Right. And you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't really see young entrepreneurs or compare yourself with others. And you just had to focus on yourself and not really compare yourself with others. And that can really jeopardize or mess up your, your, your target in the long run. Good point. Very good point. 20 years ago when I was starting my first business from scratch, just me and a push mower, and, you know, I grew that business to 150 people. And to your point, yeah, there was a lot less distraction. It was like, there was one thing. It was like customers, take care of customers, go get more customers, make money, invest that money into the business, make more money. Like it's, it's, it's simple. It's hard, but it's simple. And, and there was a lot less distraction back then. So on the one hand, it's, it's easier to start a business today than it ever has been. Um, but on the other hand, to your point, there's a lot of distraction. It's hard to know what to focus on. Um, now, that put aside, uh, today, there's things like YouTube, Udemy, Masterclass, all kinds of online learning and online courses to where it, as, a, as, a start, as a budding entrepreneur, you have access to the blueprint. You have access to the knowledge bank. You have access to people who have done it before and you can learn from them. When I was coming up 20, 25 years ago, none of that existed. And so you, the only thing you could do, one thing I did was, is I would just ride around to other landscaping companies and I would ask if I could like just tour their facility and if I could just look at what they were doing. And a lot of times they would, they would let me, uh, I would go to conferences for my, for my trade uh, and, and the biggest landscaping company in that city. One year I went to one in Chicago back in 2001 and the, and the, the biggest landscaping company in Chicago let me come and tour their facility. And I was able to look at, okay, this is their systems, the processes, this is how I can apply what they're doing to, to my business. And so like literally like 20 years ago, you had to get in the trenches to learn this stuff the hard way. Now all of that stuff exists online uh, and you can learn these things a lot quicker. So there's a lot of stuff out there and it's easy to get sidetracked on what's not important, but the, the, the answer to your questions is uh, accessible to you. And so it's just hard to know what to, what to focus on, but it is easier if you, if you can apply that focus on the right things in my opinion yeah there's i think nowadays we have it an abundance in information and now 
you just have to execute the information's out there you have to learn right. and execute um that's so right. how, how execution you... is, 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 is execution is the thing that's in uh, short supply from what I've seen. Yeah, for sure. Now, how do you go from you working by yourself to scaling to 150 people? I mean, that sounds really difficult. Um, did you hire, you know, a bunch of friends, family members first, and then over time got more contractors or what? Did it wrong every way you could do it wrong. Uh, to your point, I hired friends, bad, bad idea. Uh, that never works. Uh, hired family members, bad idea. That never works. Um, I would hire people at the wrong times. I would hire people just because I was tired of working so hard. And I was like, oh, man, I just need some help. Um, and I didn't understand when you're hiring like your first employee, second, third employee, you have to do it from a position of, of strength. You have to understand, okay, I'm leaving money on the table. I have my little systems in place. I understand this is how we get customers. This is how we keep them. This is how we, how we get more customers. And now I need more staff because I'm literally leaving money on the table and I have a little process, I have a little system that I can plug them in. That's how like, ideally you would hire your first, your first uh, helpers. I did it wrong. I was just like, yeah, you know, like I'm tired of working so hard. I, I really would use some help. And I would hire a person and I'll realize, oh crap, I really can't afford to pay this person because I don't have the numbers figured out. I don't have the unit economics figured out. I don't understand like for every labor hour they're working, this is how much I'm billing out. This is what my margin is. And then this is how I'm allocating that margin. So it took me a long time to, to, to figure that out and do it wrong. Um, but, the, but like I was saying, like you can, you can learn these blueprints from other businesses, other entrepreneurs that have already gone through it. And even in your specific niche and industry, somebody has already laid this out for you. You might have to pay for that, that knowledge. You might have to buy a few courses, buy a few eBooks, buy a few, uh, uh, what do they call them? Like knowledge products to, to find mm -hmm. the one that's good for you. But you can like save yourself years. Like it took me five, six years just to figure this stuff out, doing it the wrong way and almost going broke several times. So for me, like any business, doesn't matter what you're in, your first employees, you really kind of have to have a little process and a system that you know what you're going to plug them into before you hire them. One book that I read that really helped me uh, kind of codify this is called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And in that book, he talks about laying out literally an org chart for what your business is. And, and so like in the, in the book, the example is a pie shop and this lady has a pie shop and, and she, her business is just a mess and they had to lay out an org chart. So you have the baker, you have the person that cleans the shop, you have the, the person that uh, pressure washes the sidewalks out, out front. You have like the person that does the books, the person that does the marketing, like you have the person that creates the recipes, you have all of these different people. Now in the first, like day one, it's your name on all of these roles. And you like for every one of these roles, you've created a, a spec doc that is like roles and goals. This is like what they do. This is how we uh, uh, measure their success. This is like the KPIs that we measure them against. And then like, so your name is on like 40 different roles. But then as time goes on and you can increase sales, and you have little processes uh, put in place. You can then peel your name off of one of these and like get a, get a subcontractor or an employee to, to take care of that role. And so doing it right that way with a plan in place day one can can spell the the fate of your business um and it, and it can also save yourself years of of doing it the wrong way and also potentially save yourself from going broke yeah and what when you started your, your first landscaping business did you use your own initial capital or did you scale one person at a time like hiring one one contractor at a time yeah good question so for me, uh, in, in every business I've ever been a part of, I've always self-funded them. So I've, I have always grown them off of the revenues that the, gener that the business generated. For me, um, one of my philosophies in business is that revenue and sales is the best form of financing for a business because it forces you as the business owner, as the entrepreneur, to always be focusing on your customer. Because if you get ahead of yourself and you, you take on a, a, an outside investor, if you don't make the right bets with that capital, it could be lights out. So from, for, in my opinion, for most entrepreneurs, taking outside capital from angels and, and venture capitalists usually is a bad bet. Uh, that said, I mean, if you, if you look at your phone and, and like the, on the first three screens, like probably every app on that phone is, is venture backed. And so mm -hmm. like 
if you're going to swing for the fences, you're probably going to have to take venture capital. But if you want to build a, a good, profitable business that you can that you can make money and reinvest that money back into the business, it's probably a better bet to go self-funded and, and bootstrap it. So for me, both businesses, the first one, uh, the first one was a very asset heavy business. Uh, at the end of it, I had something like a hundred trucks going out every single day, millions of dollars of equipment. Uh, all of it was like acquired through sales uh, of, that the company generated. All of it was paid, paid for debt free. Uh, a business mentor of mine growing up, uh, was Dave Ramsey. And, and so like, I would listen to Dave Ramsey every single day. And one of the things he preaches is, is, uh, managing your personal finances debt free and your business finances debt free. And that worked for me. That was actually the reason why I was able to sell that company for millions of dollars was because the company was debt free. Most businesses in that space, uh, might've had a $5 million company, but they also had $5 million in debt. Whereas my business was a, was, a, was doing ten million dollars a year in in revenue, and we had zero debt, so it was a very profitable, clean company that was easy to acquire, and it was and being debt free was probably the main reason why I was able to get it sold. So that's been my philosophy, my approach. I'm not saying that's the only silver bullet to success, but from my experience, that's that's what's worked for me is growing your business just solely off the revenue that it generates is usually a better bet for most business owners. Mm -hmm. So you never took out a loan or reach out to a lender to rent out like trucks and all the equipment that goes down for, for landscaping, right? Never did. Self um, you just scaled one self piece at Self-funded everything. And so, uh, and that's not typical for that business. Most, most, uh, a, a, any, any construction company, landscaping company is going to have, uh, lease payments is going to have equipment loans, but I, I just never, never did it that way. Uh, for me, it was like, okay, we need another truck. Brand new truck is $75,000. Okay. Well, we can't afford that. So maybe we get like a three-year-old truck. How much is that? That's $22,000. Okay, cool. How are we going to get 22 grand? Cause we don't have 22 grand. Well, we're going to have to increase sales by like 5% and then, you know, we can get 20 grand in the bank over the next three months. Okay. We got to do that. Okay. So how are we going to increase sales 5%? Well, we're just not closing as many deals as we should be. Well, let's look at that. Let's figure out how we're going to close more deals. Well, why aren't we closing up deals? Well, because we're losing out deals because this competitor has this better offering than we do. Okay. Well, we have to fix that in our business. So as you can see, as I'm going through this process, I'm now fixing things that's wrong with my business. And so being self-funded and debt-free forces a, a certain level of discipline to create a much more efficient business and really a, a, a more compelling offering to your clients and customers in terms of a stronger value proposition, because it just forces this discipline to just build a better business. Mm -hmm. And initially you kind of have to do everything yourself, you know, find the customers, hire people, do the marketing, make the website. Um, but over time, you're only one person. As you start to scale the business, you need to hire other people, not just contractors, but, you know, maybe even accountants, people who manage the, do the SEO for your website, customer service. Um, were those like really key like factors in your business? Because, you know, if you focus on one thing, if you're really good at marketing, you want to focus on marketing and let the other guys kind of do the dirty work on things that you're not the best at. Right. Great, great, uh, great question. Great point. I think in the early days of, of starting any business, whether it be a traditional landscaping company like I had or a total digital platform like GreenPal, like I'm running now, uh, I think it helps as the entrepreneur, the CEO, the co-founder to be a general generalist, to be pretty good at a lot of different things. Um, and and it, the reason is, is because to your point in the early days, you're going to have to self-execute a lot of these things. And so there's the 80-20 rule. Uh, which is like 20% of the knowledge of any particular domain it can help you accomplish 80% of whatever it is you got to do. So you got to get like 80, 20 on all of this stuff. So for like green pal in the early days, um, you know, it had to be 80, 20 good at coding, copywriting, SEO, marketing, paid channels, customer service, design, user experience, uh, freaking bug tracking, uh, marketplaces, uh, economics of marketplaces, how to build the right platform, how to recruit vendors, how to like, uh, how to speak, a bit, how to speak the language that our vendors understand in terms of like communicating our value proposition, how to improve our value proposition, like getting good at like 80, 20 at all these things. 
because you can't afford to hire like a specialist for all of these things day one. And even if you could, you really wouldn't even know what to tell them to do because you don't even, you're just kind of like making it up as you go. So it can help to uh, be like half ass good at all of these things. And then as you develop processes and systems around what you're doing, you can then from a position of strength, uh, delegate uh, these tasks to specialists who are much better than you and who can just go deep on. Them. And you're not, you're delegating from like a position of stewardship and not abdication. And so what I mean by that is like, let's say you hate doing bookkeeping and you've never cracked open your books. You don't even know if you're making money. You haven't looked at any of the accounting and you just hire a bookkeeper and you're like, deal with this bull crap because I don't want to deal with it. That's, that's delegation by, by abdication, meaning I don't want to deal with it. You handle it. It's not a real good way to delegate anything. What ideally it's like, okay, I've been doing the books for two hours every single night. I've been bean counting all this stuff. I have all these spreadsheets. I understand that unit economics. I understand where we're making money and where we're losing money. I understand all the tracking. And now like I have a process and I would need a bookkeeper to help take this off my plate because I want to focus on higher leverage things. That's delegation from authority. That's delegation from like stewardship. And then that, then that bookkeeper can probably improve on those processes and you can have a symbiotic relationship with them. So, so like I've done it wrong, like I did it wrong the first way for years. And so that's how I would like recommend any entrepreneur as they're, as they're taking on helpers, whether it be staff, consultants, subcontractors, try to delegate from a stewardship standpoint. You've done it yourself for a long period of time. Now you're delegating like from a position of strength. I think it is important to, if you're working by yourself, to learn everything, right? Because if you learn everything and if you, when you hire people, you kind of know what the job, like what the job is, what needs to be done. And you have an idea. Yes, that person can be 10 times better than you, but at least right. you have an idea of what's going on, you know? Um, that's a good point. Exactly. Okay. The, so the, I was going to say. first years of Green Pal, I had to learn how to like write code and I'd never done any of that before. So I had to learn how to write code only so I can call bullshit on when on when 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 developers are telling me a certain thing yeah yeah we really can't do that because xyz ah bullshit i've actually done this i know how to do it i don't have the week to do it but i know it can be done therefore no go back to the drawing board and make it happen so yeah to your point you gotta kind of have to like be kind of good at all this stuff yeah um that just reminded me i had one friend and he wanted to make an app he had no idea how to do it and he was going to hire someone and I think the guy was gonna charge him like $10,000 and he didn't do it, right? And so the idea went out the window. However, months down the line, he realized that he could have done it for maybe $1,000, you right. know? And that's because he wasn't knowledgeable in that. So he easily could have exactly. ripped off. So now you, you, sell, you, you scale your business to 150 employees. Um, now, once you sell it, you decided to travel, right? Take a break. Yeah, yeah. So sold that sold that first company, retired, started traveling a little bit, uh, loved that. But then I started to understand that when it comes to business, like I think any good entrepreneur, they are their business. There's no distinction between the business and themselves. These are controversial opinions, like the whole work life balance thing is is just being popular. But for me, business is so damn hard. Like it, you, your business is ingrained in your DNA. And so like when I sold that first company, it was like a piece of me went away mm -hmm. and it was, it was really um, an unexpected mourning process that I had to go through. And then I kind of felt like, okay, well, I'm, I understood about myself that one of the things that brings me like fulfillment, joy and happiness in life is winning in business. And one of the things that like gets me going is, is getting stuff done and driving the ball forward on some kind of thing. And so that's why I started this, my second company, Green Pal, and got back in the trenches. And it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be getting that business started. I, I was naive to a degree, but looking back, I'm glad I was. So I kind of understood that about myself was that for me, like happiness is building a smart team of people focusing everybody on one objective and like crushing it and like winning and building a product that people like to use and people get value from that's, that's what brings me joy. So I had to learn that the hard way. I, I, I thought the goal was to get the first business sold and retire and like live a good life. 
And what I didn't understand was like, there's only so many beaches you can lay on. At the end of the day, it's like life is about creating opportunities for others around you. And, and like seeing that come to fruition is just why I do what I do. So, okay, you saw your business, you saw your company, and you had the vision of, you know, just retiring and having fun, traveling the world. And you came to the realization that, you know, this is boring now. And you wanted to offer more to the world, build more businesses. And from there, you started GreenPal, right? right? From ground zero. From ground zero. Uh, and I didn't understand, like, so here's, here's a good lesson to learn. Uh, my two, I, I recruited two co-founders who were just, were lifelong friends of mine. And we got started on it and we literally uh, believed that we were just going to pay a development shop in Nashville to build the platform and then we would market it and that's how we would approach it. So we, we pulled together our own money and we got something like, like 150 grand together between the three of us, uh, put it on credit cards, whatever. And we paid a, uh, we paid a dev, a dev shop in Nashville uh, every dime we had to build this thing. They spent six, seven months building it. We released it. It was a total piece of crap. Nobody wanted to use it. Uh, I, we ha had to beg people to use it, friends and family. And, uh, and we, we actually, we had no user acquisition strategy. So we just, we decided, okay, well, we got to get people to use it. And so we passed out flyers all over Nashville. And so here I am, you know, I just sold my first business for, for, for seven, se multi seven figures. And now I'm passing out door hangers. It was very humbling, but it was a good exercise for me to, to get back to square one and, and, and almost back to the purity of starting a business. Uh, so we were able, we, we passed like a hundred thousand of these things in, in, in the heat uh, throughout Nashville. And uh, we got a hundred, couple hundred people to use it. And so we were able to sit down with those first users and understand, okay, this is actually where we're wrong on what we think our value proposition is. This is what the problem that we thought we were solving. We're actually solving this problem. And we were able to like take all of this feedback and apply it to the second version of green pal that we actually built ourselves. So we had to go back to square one, learn how to code, learn how to design software and self execute all of these things to build the second version of the platform. It wasn't. It, and then we learned very quickly that this was not a dynamic in which we thought we could just outsource the, the development and, and be off to the races. Uh, we literally scrapped the entire thing that they, these guys built and we, we, we started from scratch and built it ourselves. So over a two year period of time, we, we, we wasted 150 grand uh, and we had to start all over again and like teach ourselves all the skills that we had to learn to, to actually build and execute and, and bring to life the real version that people wanted. Mm -hmm. So you guys never pivoted. You kind of just got feedback from those hundred people and did a, an iteration of that to kind of improve the systems and uh, the app that you have? Shockingly, uh, the idea that was in my head in 2012, 2013 is the same idea that we uh, have in, in, you know, in practice today. It's like, it's hard to get your grass cut reliably by a good lawn mowing service. You have to call like 20 people to get one quote. You should be able to push a button and just make it happen. And so we are building that, like push a button and make it happen. So like that hasn't changed. We haven't pivoted off that, but how we communicate that value proposition has been modified quite a bit over the years in terms of feedback uh, from users. We thought that in the early days, we thought we were building the cheapest way to get this service done. Uh, mm -hmm. We thought, okay, well, if you get five quotes, you should be able to compare those, hire the cheapest one and, and you're good. When in fact, after talking to several hundred people uh, after, the, after we launched the first version, they just wanted a reliable way, a fast way to get this done because they've already been stood up by three or four lawn services. Their, their existing uh, services flaked on them and their grass is now four feet tall and they desperately need somebody to come out today or tomorrow. That's, the, what, our, that's what our platform is built to do. It's like, okay, let's get this done. And you hire the person they actually will show up. And, and so that's the problem we solve. And so our value proposition is, is to get it done, get it done quick and know that it's going to happen and not necessarily the cheapest way. And so that's something we learned uh, just through talking to our users in the early days and even still to this day. It's, it's funny, like, like continuous, like a continuous river of feedback from your customers and your users is just critical uh, in any kind of business. And as simple as that, as that sounds, um, it's not often practiced. You have to mm -hmm. like have an easy way for people to reach you. For us, we have intercom uh, chat installed in, in our app 
anybody can talk to any uh, to one of our customer service agents or me personally seven days a week. Even now, you know, we have 200,000 people using the platform. We're going to do $20 million this year in revenue, but still seven days a week, I do like two hours of, of customer support every day just because I want to like have my finger on the pulse of, okay, this is where we're delighting people, but this is where we still suck. And this mm -hmm. is where people are getting left hanging. And so like, I'm never at a loss of understanding, okay, this is where we need to focus the team on building and fixing. Cause I always know like in, in my soul, because I'm always talking to users. That's just table stakes for, for any business. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to tech, either hardware or software, um, there is going to be really difficult. So say you, you invested $150,000 in the development team in, in Tennessee, right? To make the app, right? Um, right? Now, do you think that there was a better way looking back to have like a minimum viable product that you don't have to invest 150 K in an app for it not to work. You think there's a, you think there's a better way having a minimum yeah, viable product to, to get the, the ball rolling. Absolutely. Like, like, uh, you know, it took us three years just to breathe life into this thing and, and get it going from scratch. I could do that now in a month, knowing what I know now. Uh, but it's, it's hard because, um, you look at, successful tech companies, successful entrepreneurs, you know, whether they're raising a big round or they just sold their business for $50 million. And you look at that and you're like, damn, man, that's awesome. They did all that in that short period of time, how they do that. And what you don't understand is a lot of times like they've crashed and burned two or three or four times before they even step to the plate on that idea. And so a, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially, especially in the tech, in the tech space, like failure, and starting something and failing is almost like the the price of admission to the game. Now we didn't fail with Green Pal, but it took us way too long to to go through those lessons. Like it took us three years to launch that first version that was a piece of crap, and then learn how to like code and build the second version, and then learn how to build a tech team, and then learn how to like build like a marketplace and like the economics around that. Like it took us way too long, but we had to learn. And so to answer your question, is there a shortcut through all that other than just like doing it and failing? I mean, yeah, it's, it's like listening to podcasts, seeking out people who have done it before and like learning from their mistakes can save you months and years. Um, you know, Y Combinator has, has got a, a real good YouTube channel that even I listen to and watch every day. And like they're interviewing founders all the time that have, that have done it wrong. So like learning from other people's mistakes and trying to apply those to your journey can help save you time. But a lot of times there's no shortcut for just, just experience. It's I mean, just experience is the best teacher. I didn't want to like say shortcut my like minimal viable product. Say an example with like uh, platforms like Kickstarter and people want to create uh, a product, like a physical product. And of course, if you have, if you want that to be manufactured, for example, right. Um, a mold, just for that one product can be like $10,000. And that's a huge right. initial investment, right? Of course, no one's going to throw that out the back because um, you don't know if it's going to be a good uh, idea. You don't know if it's going to execute. And so what you do is um, you create a really basic version and you maybe send it out to like a hundred people. And instead of investing $10,000, you have a cheaper product for like maybe a thousand and you get customer feedback and then you get more customer feed feedback. You get more iterations until you get that final design. Um, because you guys, went, you guys went for the juggernaut of like just hiring someone and maybe expecting that one app to, to work right away. But that was not the case. It took you much longer to, uh, to get to that point where things got rolling. Absolutely. Um, this is, this is tough because you, know, you read the lean startup and that's everything you just said is the, is the thesis of that book. And it is the truth, right? Like the more you can de-risk this idea with a prototype, with an MVP, um, the better off you are in terms of wasting potentially years of your life going down the wrong path and building the wrong thing. So that's absolutely true. But there's two different ways to look at it. It's like a lot of times you're not going to get the feedback you need unless you release something that works and something that is go actually like something that uh, actually will fulfill whatever it is, the promise that you're, you're promising your users or your customers. So that, that's tough. You can like get false, like false feedback if you release like this piece of crap and it's like, Oh yeah, no, um, it actually is a bad idea because nobody wants it. Well, they didn't want it because it's a piece of crap. So like 
there is like a minimum standard even that you have to release just to even like get the feedback that you need. Um, so that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, and, and so I don't, uh, like, I don't, I don't just preach the minimum viable product and the lean startup methodology, uh, as like total gospel. Cause I think sometimes it can lead you down the wrong path. The other thing too, is that there's, there's the minimum bio product. And then there's also like the minimum viable, like user acquisition strategy. Like it almost doesn't matter how good the product is. If you can't drive people to it, it doesn't matter. Like, so, so even like before you even build anything, before you lay down the first line of code, it can probably even save you potentially years to try to drive users and traffic to whatever that thing is. And because it doesn't matter how good this platform or product is going to be, uh, if you can't get users for it, if you don't have any kind of innovation around user acquisition, then it's not going to matter. Uh, and, and you could, you can't just like check that box with, oh, we're going to run Facebook ads or we're going to run Google ads or we're going to do SEO. Like that's not even good enough. Like there, there's going to have to be some sort of thing that you're going to have to innovate around in terms of user acquisition to, to make it. And so that, that, that even comes before how good the product is. Mm -hmm. So like in tandem with uh, I'm validating, is this a good idea? Like another like layer of complexity is I need to validate, if, can I get people to use this thing scalably? And like, how am I going to do that? And so an example would be like, let's just say, uh, let's just say like you're creating a platform, like, I don't know, next door, which is like the, the, the social network for neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. Their user acquisition strategy is people publishing content that other people want to read. And then that gets shared. And, and then so like, okay, this is a self-fulfilling loop that we understand. This is how we're going to acquire people at a local level because our users will create this content. And then I think it gets, it gets exposed. People don't even know what next door is. Like they thought about that day one. Right. So like these, thinking about those things in terms of like, okay, not only I got to validate, do people want this? If I have to validate, how am I going to acquire the first thousand people to use it? Like, or else it doesn't matter how good this is. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you, how did you go about customer acquisition? Because, you know, from what I hear from friends and family, they find uh, the lawn services either through word of mouth, you know, maybe a family member recommends one person and they call that person and they do the lawn for them, right? Uh, for a new service like GreenPal, um, it can be very, very efficient, convenient, and you do have to rely on programs where you give out, you know, a free service to 100 people, and then you know you give incentive like, oh, if you refer someone, then you get you know a discount or a free um, lawn service for for one day or another. Um, what kind of incentives or programs or strategies did you, did you implement to get more customers? Yeah. Great, great, great question. That goes, it goes right in hand with everything I just talked about. So it's like, how do you get users to use this thing? doesn't matter how good GreenPal is. Mm -hmm. Like we have to drive people to use it. So to your point, usually like, let's say you need a lawn mowing service. You're going to ask friends and family first. They're going to give you a bunch of names and numbers. Okay. You're going to call all those people. Maybe they don't call you back. So you're like, okay, what do I do now? A lot of people will just turn to Google and they'll put lawn mowing service nearby. Now, as simple as that is and like, okay, that's our channel. Betting on SEO is like a bet the company decision. So we made an early choice early on uh, after passing out like a hundred thousand door hangers in Nashville, we realized, okay, this is not a scalable user acquisition strategy. Like my co-founder got bit by a dog. And so we realized like <laughs> 10 customers per dog bite was not a good way to get customers, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so like we had to learn, okay, we got to bet the company on a channel. And so we started realizing, okay, well, actually people are searching for lawn mowing services in Google. Um, let's just try to compete in that. And, and so we started studying SEO, started studying, okay, this is how you execute it and, and, and search. And we made a real, uh, like, a, like a hard choice in the early days. Okay, we have to bet the company on this channel because it's going to require, like, we built the product in a certain way. It's going to require, like, we, we put a lot of our development resources uh, on this in the early days. And so that is the main way we get users even to this day. Like over half our users come through search. The other half come through word of mouth. And so for us to compete in search, we have to look at ways to innovate. And so, so we, we create unique content around these lawn mowing services that use our platform. We write like bios about their history and things that make their, unique, their business unique. And we expose that to Google. And it's unique content that we've created, we've curated. Um, and it doesn't exist anywhere else. 
And so when you're looking when you're looking for a lawn mowing service in you know Hartford, Connecticut, we we pop up one, two, or three as an option that Google surfaces to you to, to consider. And a lot of people uh, come to our landing page. They understand very quickly in less than three seconds. Okay, this is what Green Pal is. This is how to solve my problem. And they sign up in less than a minute. And before they know it, within within a few minutes, they have somebody to to, to mow their yard. Mm -hmm. So like all of that is how we get users and it's how we've crafted our platform to compete in that channel. So thinking through those, those, those sequences when you're starting a business from scratch is critical because uh, a lot of people over index on the product to solve the problem and they under index on, okay, this is how we're going to get users. Yeah. And so you guys started in 2012, 2013, right? That's right. Yeah. We started, uh, summer of 2013. Okay. So that's like in the midst of like web 2.0 and all these social media apps were coming out, Twitter, Facebook, all that type of stuff. Um, so while that was developing, did you kind of look at those social media platforms as tools to help, uh, increase like your brand exposure, get green pal, you know, more exposure in, into the market? Yeah. So to your point, uh, 2012 was a pivotal like year, in terms of mobile uh, coming online. And, you know, we have a lot of analog examples uh, of the why GreenPal would work. Uh, Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, these were platforms that were surfacing, like that were mobile first, that were solving problems in the real world, like 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 analog problems, like, like transactions that were happening in the real world. Technology was just now uh, making those transactions become uh, a lot easier. And so we had like analog examples to look at and say, okay, yeah, no, this, this would work for us. And so we kind of rode that trend and we were able to, to understand, okay, yeah, we can like focus on this one thing and, and do it like these guys are doing it for this other thing. As far as like how social came into play for, uh, for that, um, for us, like social media, we had to learn like the hard way was not a real good way uh, to acquire users. And we thought it was going to be. Um, but the reality is, is that, we do best when somebody has the need for our service. So that would be search. They are expressing the, the need for it. So somebody is typing into Google, I need my lawn cut. That's where we're best to apply our resources because we can match against that, that intent. Um, passively like advertising against people that, that don't have the need for this service and like maybe putting into their mind that they might need it. It just doesn't work for us. And that's, tip, that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of channel that social is usually is Instagram, uh, Facebook. For me, it typically seems to work better for like branding, like clothing, travel, like inspirational things. Whereas if somebody has a need for a plumber, a need for a locksmith, a need for a lawn mowing service, like search is, is more of a channel. It's more congruent to be effective. Mm -hmm. And to provide, like, to provide some context, you don't just connect homeowners to just your regular like person, like say a teenage a kid wants to make money mowing lawns. Um, he or she can't use GreenPal to make money. You guys should connect the homeowners to more experienced professional uh, lawn services, right? Like contractors. Yeah, good question. So, when it comes to like lawn mowing services, it's very fragmented. There's there's a there's a thousand different lawn mowing services in your in in the like I don't know like if you're say you're in the Connecticut area. And there's hundreds of them and you don't know which ones are good, which ones are not good, which ones are experienced, which ones are not. You don't necessarily want the big company that's got like 10 crews because they're not going to give you the personalized service that you need. But then again, you also don't want the teenager that doesn't have any equipment, no insurance, uh, you know, may flake on you when they go back to school. Like that's just going to be a pain in the ass too. So it's, it's, so it's, it's our job as a platform to match you with the perfect fit. So it's like somebody that maybe is mowing 10 yards, but they want to mow a hundred this year. And they, maybe they're a, they're like a fireman or a teacher and they mow yards three days a week. That's the perfect sweet spot because then you get connected with somebody who can do it at a great price, who's reliable, who gives you personalized service. You would have never been able to find them any other way, but you jump on the green pound, you can just hire them like you're hiring an Uber. So while the suppliers on our platform are not like total fungible commodities, like an Uber or a Lyft, um, they're more like talented trades people. Um, it's our job to, to enable you to find them, sort out which one is the best fit for you and to hire them at a snap without even making a phone call. So that's what we do. Um, we screen out the, the, the really low end providers. Uh, and, and we also 
like give you access to people that you wouldn't even find online because they don't have any sort of brand presence. Like yeah. it's our job to connect you with that good fit. I feel like that's a massive challenge because, you know, not only do you have to convince the homeowners that's a good service, but you also have to convince the people actually doing the services, you know, the, the professionals doing the lawn services to hop on this platform and, and use it to the benefit. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the, it is the challenge for any marketplace uh, because you have two, two customers, two constituents that you have to solve problems for. And you have to orchestrate, orchestrate the, the balance between those because they both, their, their needs and, and desires are not usually aligned. And so for like lawn mowing services, we have to, we have to like develop a platform that makes their life easier. That makes uh, their job a, a whole lot simpler because that, that's kind of the honey and the glue that, that, that attracts and keeps them. For homeowners, we have to develop a process that allows them to hire these people at, in a snap and it's a whole different set of software. And so it's, it's one of the challenges in any marketplace is like catering to supply and then also catering to, met, to demand and like striking the balance between the two. And that's why it takes so many years and a lot of, usually a lot of venture capital to bring one of these things uh, from zero to one. And uh, for us, the only thing that's gotten us where we are is the sheer grit and tenacity of not giving up and just figuring out what works for both sides of that transaction. Mm -hmm. And during your journey of, of GreenPal, um, was there like an inflection point where things really started kicking off or was it just like kind of linear and things just started scaling? Yeah, we don't really, if you look back, it's, it's like a, it's a gradual like growth from zero customers to 200,000. There was never mm -hmm. this hockey stick moment. Okay. And so, you know, it's, uh, it just depends on how you frame those numbers, right? But uh, for us, that's, that's the way it's been. It's been a, like that we've doubled every year, right? Like every year for the past six years, we've doubled in terms of revenue. But there was never this aha moment where we just created a silver bullet and just like, and it was just off to the races. Now, yeah. now to your question is like, when did we know it was going to work? It was maybe like the summer of uh, 2014 or 15. I can't remember, but it was Saturday and my, my team and I were, were working. We worked like six, seven days a week for the first three or four years. And it was a Saturday and I think 30 people signed up and I didn't know who any of them were. And so that was the moment that I was like, oh, this could work. <laughs> it's like I didn't know these people. <laughs> and that must that be very was the exciting. thing that gave me hope. <laughs> <laughs> now, for any small business owner or young entrepreneur who wants to start their own business and say they need some capital or they've been running it for a while and they want to bring someone on board, like a team or, uh, or a partner, right? And one of the best ways is like, yeah, you can bootstrap it, be reliable totally upon yourself of, you know, getting that initial money, or you can bring in a partner. Um, like say you don't have a lot of money within your business. Um, you can't afford someone, right? But you want to bring in a partner and you give them say 5% equity or ownership of the business. And how do you kind of delegate? Oh, I want this partner to own 5% of the business, but he or she has to put in the work. And how do you kind of like agree on terms? Like if he or she leaves one year down the line, does that person still own like 5% of the company? Um, or, is yeah, it just good better, or is it just better to like work on yourself, gain the initial capital so you can hire people that you know will work for you? Man, it's a great question. It's, and it's so hard because if you get it wrong, it, it, it can spell doom for your business. Uh, Co-founders is like one of the like main causes of, of failure in these startups. And so step one, like if you're going to take on a co-founder, you've got to get somebody who has a skill set that you don't have. And so it could be like, let's say, you know, a good, a good dynamic usually is like a hacker and a hustler. And so like a hacker would be like somebody who's just really good at writing code, who has just been building stuff their whole, you know, for, the, all through high school and college and just loves building products and building and hacking on stuff like somebody who has just like built products just to, for free just to mm -hmm. do is ideally who you're looking for and then a hustler like somebody who a hacker and a hustler so a hustler would be somebody who just loves crushing it like 
to use the flyer example, like you say, if it's 105 degrees outside, it's like, hey, we got to pass out 100,000 flyers uh, in the next month to, to get users who would just like love to do that for 12 hours. Kind of like Steve Jobs and like Steve Wozniak with Apple. You know, one guy was a complete, you know, he knew his electronics, knew his hardware. And then Steve Jobs didn't know too much about that, but he was a hustler, called people and just made deals, you know, got the business right. going. Yep. That's what you want. That's what, that's what you're looking for. Hacker and a hustler. So if, if you're both hustlers, I mean, that's, that's okay, but it's going to be tough to execute on the tech piece. If you're both hackers, um, then you're both just going to want to sit in a room and code all day and you're not going to get any customers. So, that's like step one, make sure you're recruiting a co-founder who has got a different skill set that you do not have. And it, and it goes down to the DNA level, like who you are as a person. Um, the next thing is, it's like, unless the two of you are coming together and with this idea and putting the same amount of money in, and I mean, like, let's say you're already going and like, you've gotten it to first base and now you're like, damn, I need a co-founder. It would, it would be a smart to like date them first. So let's say you're a hustler and you need a hacker and it's like, okay, just like pay them. See if first, see if they really want to work on your, on your idea. See if they're infected with your vision. See if like they love your passion and like maybe they might just work on it for free with you for a couple of weeks or a month, a couple of months. And then maybe you kick them a couple hundred bucks uh, a week to, to work on it. And you just see like, okay, yeah, I'm paying this guy 200 bucks, but he's giving me $2,000 of work because he believes in this idea. Like he's passionate about it or she, that can be a good signal that this would be a good person to, to start the business with. Like, cause literally like it's, it's as important a decision as who you marry, who you marry. Mm -hmm. I guess it's important because it's, it's actually easier to get divorced in a marriage context than it is to like divorce your co-founder. So man, like it's one of those things that a lot of times people just get lucky you know, they had just, they just found the right fit. And that, I think that is probably true in marriage too. And so it's like, if you don't think about these things and like work through it, uh, you, you might just be rolling the dice on and hope that it works out. Now to your point, now the other piece of question was like, okay, all that said now, like, how do I protect myself legally? And how do I like put in the block and tackling legally? Um, yeah, you can have things like, uh, like, a investing investing schedule so let's say they have first of all five points is probably going to be too low that's probably more like a, a, an employee dynamic um, but let's say that your your co-founder had 10 or 15 or 20 percent and you're like well what if they disappear in three months well this is pretty standard uh but you can have vesting schedules so it's like uh, for the first year uh there's a called a cliff so if they don't make it past the first year all of their equity like goes off a cliff and they and they like they don't get anything and then over a four or five year period of time, that equity vests. So it's like, okay, after end of the year two, uh, they have 20 points, but like now only five points have vested. After year three, now 10 points have vested. Year four, all 15, and year five, all 20. So it's like they don't actually accrue the real ownership of that equity until these years have passed on the calendar. And so that gives you kind of time to like work through the dating process and like unravel one of these things um, it's just not working out and, and that, that could spell the, the success or failure of your startup. Yeah, I think, yeah, just finding one co-founder, even two will complicate things. But as long as you have different um, things to bring up to the table, that's the most important thing. I think that's a good point. Like you can't have two of the same person because over time, I think one person's going to want to like dominate or be the leader or the figure of that one aspect. If you, if you have two cooks in the kitchen, then it's not going to be the best. Uh, Absolutely. Ideally, you'd have a chef and you would have somebody who's just going to do everything else and grow the restaurant. Mm -hmm. That's the good dynamic because it's like the chef's creating these unique recipes and then you got somebody who's making sure that the staff is there, who's marketing it, making sure all this shit is happening. Like mm -hmm. that, that's a good dynamic. If you have two chefs, it's going to be tough. Yeah. And when do you know when to sell a business? I think this can go for any young entrepreneur as well because, uh, you know, people who have maybe even their own e-commerce business, their own tech uh, business, they can go to an online marketplace and literally sell their, their business. Um, when do you think is the right time to sell a business? Mm, it's tough. Uh, because on the one hand, if you start a business and it's like, I'm going to sell it when I get to $5 million in ARR and I'm going to sell it for 20 million bucks. 
like I've seen that work, you know, but on the other hand, there's this, there's this theory around the infinite game. And Simon Sinek just wrote a book uh, called The Infinite Game. I haven't read it. I'm going to read it. But the crux of the book is, like, if you look at the Revolutionary War, the, the U.S. won that war because they viewed it as an infinite game. And they viewed it as, uh, we're just going to fight this war until we win. We're never going to give up. Conversely, you look at Vietnam, uh, we didn't have that approach. Actually, uh, the Vietnamese did. And so they viewed it as an infinite game. And that's why they won that war. And so you, I think to make it, especially in like a tech startup, you have to view it as an infinite game. Like you, you can't like go in, in my opinion, with like a, like I'm going to flip this in two years because it's just so damn hard. It doesn't matter if you're just trying to build a website or a business to do only a million dollars in revenue. It's just going to be really hard to, that first million is a bitch. And so all that said, how do you know when it's time to, to quit when it's not quit, but like exit, um, when you don't love doing it anymore, that could be a good signal. Uh, what are your personal goals? Like maybe, maybe, maybe something's happened in your personal life and like you just don't want to work 30, 40, 50, hundred hours a week or whatever. And you just, you want to like change your personal life. Um, those can be good signals or you see a short window of opportunity in like the macroeconomic climate. It's like, okay, my type of business, let's say you have a tool uh, that helps uh, hotels, um, better understand like the personal details of their high-end clientele and like you notice that there's a lot of uh consolidation going on in the hotel industry and you believe that that's not going to occur for longer than a couple of years and you do want to like change your your uh your family tree then yeah that's a that's, i don't see anything wrong with with seizing that opportunity but going into the business and saying oh, we're going to flip this in three years usually like changes your personal psychology to a point where you're not going to be successful. That's just been my experience. Yeah. And just to like wrap things up here, I don't want to take too much of your time. What are, like now that you have experience building one business, selling it and then starting green pal, um, what is like your next ambition projects that you kind of want to uh, work on or improve on? Good question. So to my earlier point, like I view green pal as an infinite game. Like for me, I, I, we have so much more to do in this, in this business, in this niche, in this, in this platform until like, if you look at like marketplaces, there's so many apps that you now have on your phone that are just go to default solutions that weren't there five years ago. So whether it be Instacart or, or DoorDash or, or Uber or Lyft, or like if you have a dog wag, like these, these things are just, are just default solutions to these problems. And so for us, that's where we want to place green pal into the lexicon of the English language. Like, like, okay, how'd you get to the party? I Ubered there. Your grass is three feet tall. Just get a green pal, dude. What, why are you wasting your time? Um, until we're at that point, I, I feel like we have so much more left to, to conquer. I feel that you want to make it like a, a household name, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So yeah, Brian, um, so if people want to like know more about you, find you or more, know more about GreenPal, where can they find uh, you and GreenPal? Like what handles, what websites? Um, can yeah. For so anybody is listening to this that doesn't want to waste their time cutting their grass, <laughs> uh, you can just download GreenPal in the app store or play store. You'll get hooked up with a good lawn mowing service in less than a minute. Uh, anybody wants to ping me, email is actually the best way. Uh, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N at yourgreenpal.com. I love helping entrepreneurs. If you do email me, just try to put me on second or third base on like whatever your issue or problem or question is. And I can help, you know, answer it from my humble experience. Um, but yeah, just, just feel free to hit me up. For sure. So I'll add that all in the, in the show notes, the link to, to your social media, the email, and of course the website to green pal. Awesome, man. I loved it. Had a good time. Thanks, Brian. I really do appreciate it. All right. Hey, you have a great day. Have a good one.